Hi everyone and welcome to Humankind. So this is going to be a tutorial basically, maybe even a tutorial series, where I'm going to explain a lot of the Humankind game mechanics, including the basics. So if you don't know anything about the game and you want to learn how to actually play it, this is basically the video for you. And I do have quite a lot of playtime in the game already. I had over 100 hours in the game before it was even released. I played it quite a lot before official release. So hopefully I'm competent enough to actually explain it. So before we get started, one thing you should know is that unlike many other games of this type, you do not pick your civilization leader or whatever before you actually start. You build it as you play, from many different cultures. You do choose your avatar, you can customize your avatar before you start playing, but that's purely cosmetic, basically. And this is me, by the way. So we are going to play on fairly standard settings, just a normal Pangea map, normal game pace, if you are a beginner, I wouldn't recommend going above Metropolis difficulty. Nation difficulty unlocks some AI behaviors that make it harder. But we're going to play on Nation here because that doesn't matter too much, and I'm more than fine playing on Nation myself. So, let's get started and start talking about the game, shall we? And hit that like if you find any of the content in this video helpful. I would appreciate it. So, there are some cinematics, but I'm not going to play them. I'll let you discover them yourself if you haven't seen them. So, when you first start a new game, this is what you're going to see. A little bit of terrain and one unit, one tribe unit. And unlike many other games of this type, you cannot just start a city on the first turn. So you might find that a little bit confusing initially and wonder what's going on with that. Well, what's going on with that is that we start in Neolithic era and our goal is to basically start our first culture. And in order to do that, we need to do a few things. There are four categories here in the top left corner and this is how you progress to ancient era from Neolithic era. So there's a growth star and you need to have five population and or units within your empire. Right now we have one. Each tribe unit here counts as one population. And in general, in the entire game, each unit counts as at least one population, sometimes more later in the game. So we have one population because we have one unit. Then we have knowledge star. This is basically science, so you need to get enough science. It will also unlock a legacy trade, but we'll talk about that later. And then there's a hunter star, and in order to get that, you need to kill a total of five animal units, or more. And if you do that, you will get the star and you'll be able to pick your first culture. So, in order to do that, we need to explore the map. Now, there are some resources on the map, they will be useful in the future for when we start our city and start working on our empire. There are two categories of resources that you can see on the map. That's all you need to know for now. There are luxury resources right here, like silver. They give you various bonuses to your cities. This one, for example, would give us stability and science. We're not going to talk about that too much right now, because we are not starting a city yet. And then there are strategic resources. They are unknown at first, and you'll reveal them as you play the game, as you progress through the eras. And strategic resources are needed for units, for various infrastructure improvements, and things like that. They are very important, generally speaking. So, let's go and explore a little bit. There's also no minimap in this game. You get a bigger view by zooming out, basically. This is what you do. So, this is the entire world right now. And we are right here. We are close to the South Pole, basically. 
And here's the first curiosity we discovered. So these are things you pick up with your units to get a various bonus. And this is a scientific one. There's also a food curiosity, which we might run into. We probably will. And when I move into it, I will get a little bit of science, which helps us with the knowledge star. And it also helps us to potentially secure our legacy trade. So let's move on to the next turn. Now I can pick this up. And when you hold your right mouse button, your unit will get a path to the destination you're hovering over. And as long as you hold the right mouse button, your unit will not actually move there. You will see the path it will take. So that's how that works. And you can see your exact movement points when you hover over your guy. So this guy has a total of four movement points. And as we move, this number will go down. Here you can see your current movement points left. So when I move here to pick out the curiosity, nothing else. You could learn I will get three science and five influence. And now I have three movement points. Sometimes you will need more than one. For example, if I move into this river tile, I will not be able to move any further. I will lose all my movement points. So we'll probably go west instead. And here we got the first animal. That's a mammoth. He's a big boy. And you should never attack one with a single tribe unit, because it will kill you. It will kill you basically every single time. You need at least two units. And you get further units by getting food. There is more than one way to get food in Neolithic era. One way is to pick up food curiosities, and the other one is to kill animals. But there are easier animals to kill than a mammoth. So we are not going to attack him until we get our second tribe. Here's another strategic resource, copper. And you can see that extraction is locked until we research bronze working technology. No need to worry about that right now. Just take note that there's copper over here. Here's another scientific curiosity and uh, more strategic resources. So we got one science and five influence. We will talk about resources in general a little bit later, once we actually start our first city. But what you need to know is there are four basic resources in this game, which are the same as in other Amplitude games. There's food, industry, influence, and gold. And all four are important. But we'll talk about them a little bit later. So, since we are close to the South Pole, we should probably go north. Uh, here's another curiosity, that's a scientific one. And here's a food curiosity. So we'll go pick that up, because with enough food, we will get another tribe. And with another tribe, we'll be able to split up and cover more ground. So this is the plan right now. And here's a deer. So I could attack it right now. However, it has high ground. So that's not necessarily a good idea. I might still be able to kill it, however. But let's maybe wait one turn and see what it's going to do. So if you don't want to use all of your movement points, because the game won't actually allow you to end the turn, if you have an idle army with movement points left, you can click one of these two options. Skip, which will skip the current turn, or Station, which will hold this position indefinitely or until you manually click on that unit to give it new orders. So we will skip that turn. And here we got kind of a speech bubble which is a narrative event. Humankind has a lot of narrative events of all kinds, and they give you all sorts of decisions that you have to make, which will lead to all sorts of consequences. In this case right now, we can get minus 25% on domestication research cost. That's a technology you get early on. Or we can get plus two food on city or outpost. So this is something you can decide yourself. 
there's also a bit of a narrative behind it. The idea is that you decide how you develop your culture and your civilization. We can go for the food here. So we'll grab the food. Now, if the deer doesn't move, we can attack it. Okay, it did move. So now, when you hover over a unit, any kind of unit, neutral, enemy unit, you will get this preview of what the battlefield will look like. Because in humankind, there's tactical combat, which can involve multiple units, it can involve multiple armies, so the fights can get pretty damn big. And what this means here is that this is your deployment zone, right here, my color, and the gray one is the deer's deployment zone. We will be able to deploy on any one of the tiles right here, but there will also be a flag, which is kind of the goal. The goal of each combat is either to capture the flag or to kill all the enemy units. And I do have slightly higher strength, but it's still very possible to lose if we play it incorrectly. You can also get a different battlefield if you attack from a different direction. So if I attack from here, you will see that I will be able to deploy on this tile. And that's actual high ground. So this is what we're going to do. We can do it like this. I still want to pick up that food, preferably on this turn. So we'll attack from this direction. And now we do have an option to retreat, which will move your army away in a way you cannot control. We have an option to do a manual battle and we can do instant resolution. We will do a manual battle here. And before you actually start fighting, you can decide where you want to deploy your unit or your units by right clicking on any of the tiles of your color. In this case, we will deploy on the high ground because as you might know, high ground is pretty important. And we are actually going to hold here and defend. The deer will attack us, so we will just defend on the high ground and that way we will more or less secure our victory. And you can see here, it took 42 damage, we took eight. When we hover over it, we will see the outcome of that attack. So if I attack right now, I will get a plus four bonus from the high ground. The deer will get a minus one penalty from being damaged. I will do at least 34 damage and at most 46 damage. This is kind of randomized there. And I will take at least five damage and at most 25 damage. Now combat strength in this game is very, very important. Each point of combat strength can make a pretty big difference in terms of how much damage you do or take. You don't really need to know the exact formula. I don't even know the exact formula myself. All you need to know is that it's not percentage based. It's more based on the absolute difference in combat strength between you and the opponent. So each point of combat strength is very important. And these bonuses are very important as well. There's another big bonus early on, well, at any point of the game, but it's a bonus you can take advantage of right at the start. And it's a rear attack bonus. Right now, it wouldn't make any sense to attack the deer from the rear, because I would be attacking it from the low ground. But it is a bonus and it can make a pretty big difference early on. Hopefully, we'll get to use that bonus against the mammoth a little bit later. Anyway, I will attack it from the high ground then it will attack me, and then we won. We got 5 food and 5 influence as a result of that engagement. We lost 31 health and the deer lost 100, obviously. And right, that used all of our movement points. We can pick up the food on the next turn. We are also up to 15 influence. Uh, now, when something happens each turn, you will get these notifications down here. And there is a little icon here you can click to locate that event. So in this case, that's a notification about a competitive deed. So competitive deeds are things you can do to get fame. All you need to know right now is that fame is how you win the game. The person who has the most fame at the end of the game wins. 
We'll get a little bit deeper into that later. But that's all you need to know for now. Let's grab the food here. Sustenance, so that gives us 10 food. One now I need five, five more to get my next unit. Here we can pick up another food curiosity. And that will spawn another tribe unit. And each unit has its own individual movement points. So what I can do here is actually click on the other tribe unit that just spawned and separate it from the army by right clicking on the tile next to it. And then you can see it has three more movement points. So I can still move with this guy. And we did have a scientific curiosity down here. We can go pick that up. Maybe we can secure the legacy trade. So that's our turn. We'll go grab that science. We don't have some mammoths over here, so I could kill one if I use both my tribes. Or I could explore into different directions to potentially get more tribes faster. You have to decide which one is better yourself. There's more than one way to play Neolithic era. Definitely. If there are a lot of animals in the area, it definitely makes sense to go after them. Because you don't get food for killing them. Here's another deer. So I could probably kill it. But maybe it will go on the low ground and then we could kill it without losing as much health. Uh, here's some more science as well. We can back up and go pick up that science instead. So let's keep exploring here. Here's even more science. We will grab that on the next turn. And we got another narrative event. This is an event you will get early on, which allows you to get another tribe, basically. And the alternative is usually some bonus. Like here, it's minus 25% on city defense research cost. So minus 25% is not really huge. And getting an extra tribe early on is very, very helpful. So we will grab the extra tribe. And I could even use both of these tribes now to kill some mammoths. But first, I would like to get the science over here. Here's another strategic resource. So now we'll pick up the science and then maybe kill a mammoth or two. We can merge them again into a single army, like so. And then we'll attack with both of them. Now we can pick up the other science. So there's our era star because we got enough science now. So this will also unlock the Neolithic legacy trade, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Here's some more food we can grab and even more strategic resources in the area. So once you get your era star, like we did here, you can pick your culture. Some of them have already been taken by the AI, as you can see right here. And this is pretty important. So humankind has a very interesting system for how you build your civilization. You don't pick it at the start of the game. You build it as you go. There are six eras in the game. Each of those has 10 different cultures. And you pick one of them. So in total, you will pick six different cultures throughout the entire game. And that way you build your civilization, basically. And each one of them has a total of four different bonuses of sorts. Now, this first bonus up here is shared by many different cultures. It's more of a generic bonus that has various effects. It describes what kind of culture it is. So in case of Phoenicians, it's a merchant culture. Here we got Estate culture. Here we got a militarist culture. Here we got a scientist culture. So in the next era, we will also have a scientist culture, an expansionist culture, a militarist culture, and so on. So these things will repeat the first icon up here. The rest are all unique. And these can have drastically different effects. One thing to keep in mind, however, is that the second one from the top, so this icon right here, 
this is a legacy trade. And you will get to keep this bonus for the entire game. Even when you're in the contemporary era, you have like tanks, nukes, whatever, you will still keep your ancient era legacy trade. So if I pick up the Assyrians, for example, I will have plus one land movement speed on my units for the rest of the game, forever. You get to keep that forever, no matter what you do, you will always have this bonus. And these bonuses can be pretty damn powerful, so it's definitely worth paying attention to them. The Olmecs are a pretty decent culture right at the start, early on, if you're a beginner. Mostly because influence is a pretty important resource early on. But they are all good in their own way. Some are obviously better than others for various playstyles. Stability, for example, is very, very important. And having plus two stability on every district makes these guys a pretty popular choice, actually. Egyptians are one of the early favorites because they get a lot of industry, and industry basically allows you to build things faster. So that's always good. The Harampans are also popular because food basically allows you to grow your cities, get more population. So food is always good. But we have to pick something that hasn't been claimed yet. So in case of Assyrians, they got the unit down here. Basically, every culture will have their own unique unit and their own unique district, usually. Sometimes it's something that's not a district. For example, the Hittites have an outpost, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but it's not technically a district. It kind of is and it kind of isn't at the same time, but not in the same exact way. Once you move on to the next era, which will be classical era, and pick your next culture, you will no longer be able to build these things. So that's something to keep in mind. We could go for the Babylonians. We know there's copper nearby. And as you can see, recruiting this guy will require copper. And the astronomy house will give us science, but also food. Now, since we haven't talked about cities yet, some of this might not exactly make sense, but one thing to pay attention to, in particular, is what kind of district these things count as. So if we hover over the astronomy house, we can see that it counts as both the farmer's quarter and the research quarter. This will make more sense once we get to city development, but this is very important. Any district that counts as more than one type of district can be quite powerful, even if their bonuses otherwise do not seem that great. So it's definitely something you should pay attention to. Let's go for Babylonians. We will get plus two science per research technologies in our capital. We will get the astronomy house, which again counts as both farmer's quarter and research quarter. And this will be a good one to use as an example of what you can do with unique districts. And we'll get this unique unit here. So we will add out the Babylonians. And now we are the Babylonians. We will also get to pick our legacy trait. So this is an extra trait that you will get to keep for the rest of the game. And you can claim it in Neolithic era. Again, if you meet the requirements. So there are three choices here. We can get plus one industry per population on city or outpost. So for each pop you have, you will get plus one industry. That's pretty strong. We can get plus one food or you can get plus one science. So all three of these are quite good. Since we picked the Babylonians who will give us extra science, we can go with astronomy to get even more science. But all three of these are good and viable. There's no wrong answer there, really. All three can be really useful. Now, I'm not the Babylonians yet, because I haven't finished the turn. 
Now we can click and turn, and we will become the Babylonians. The appearance of our units changed, and now they are no longer tribes, they are scouts now. So they will no longer clone with food. However, they are still worth one pop. Just something to keep in mind. Now, let's go find a good spot for our first city. And we can discuss that. We can also kill this mammoth right here. Let's do that. This is a good opportunity to talk about the rear attack bonus, actually. So we probably want to back up a little here. Because we want to be able to attack it from the back. We could go stand on this high ground. And it might attack our guy. In fact, we could almost stand on the high ground with both of them. But not quite. Okay, so now what we can do is attack it from the rear. We can also attack it from the high ground. That's plus four. But I want to specifically show you the attack from the rear bonus. I would normally attack it from the high ground here. In fact, no. Uh, we can do it even better. We will attack it from the high ground first. Now he will face our scout on the high ground. And then we can attack it from the rear with our other scout. So as you can see, attack from the rear is a plus four bonus. Same as attack from the high ground. It's a very strong bonus. And you should definitely take advantage of it when you can. And now the mammoth is dead. We got 20 gold for killing it. Since we're no longer a tribe, if we were a tribe, we would get food for killing him. But we're not. So, let's go find a good location for our city. And we'll talk about how that works exactly. And how you even start a city to begin with. Because I haven't talked about that at all. Uh, here's something relevant as well, which we haven't seen yet. It's a sanctuary. So, this is a location that spawns animals, basically. There are sanctuaries and there are lairs. And there's this icon here, which indicates the units that will spawn from this will be peaceful. A lair will have a different icon, kind of a lightning bolt. And that indicates it will spawn hostile animals. This will also apply to neutral cities later on. Over this way. But yeah, we don't need to talk about that just yet. Here's another one. And what you can do with this is use the ransack option, which is kind of like pillaging it. And in this case, that will give us plus 10 gold. And it will take one turn. Now, if we were in Neolithic era, this would give us food. But we didn't really run into one in Neolithic era. So now we will remove that and we will gain 10 gold. We can do the same exact thing with the other one. We can split our units here, so that the other guy can keep exploring. Here's yet another sanctuary, and we got some non-tundra terrain. This might make for a decent location. Here's some non-tundra terrain as well. And here's a curiosity we can pick up, but we don't have to pick it up right now. You don't want to wait too long with your first city, because the AI is certainly not going to wait. And you want to start working on your vehicles. empire, you know? It's a fair bet that okay, the naughty mammoth is stepped on the sanctuary. So I guess I will not be attacking it right now. Me. We can just keep moving and grab it later. So, how do you actually start a city? You start a city by claiming the territory, and you claim a territory by founding a new outpost. When you click on this option right here, you will get the opportunity to start an outpost somewhere. And the game will suggest a location, and the way it works is that you will exploit the tiles around your outpost by having the outpost there. Because in humankind, you claim this entire territory. You can see this outline here. This is basically one territory. And you claim all of it by having an outpost here and then a city. 
then you can attach territories to cities, but let's not get ahead of ourselves just yet. But what you need to know is that you claim this entire territory. You can't have like just a few tiles inside of it. You either have all of it or you have none of it. There's no in between. That's it. There's no other option here. So when we pick an outpost option, we will work all the tiles around the outpost as long as they are part of this territory. We can click an option in the bottom right corner here to show all the yields around here. And generally speaking, they are all important. Both industry and food are very important. So you probably want a good combination of both. You don't necessarily want a ton of food but no industry or a ton of industry but no food. You want to have at least some kind of decent balance there. So plus 12 is a lot of food, but plus 3 or plus 2 is barely any production. And you will work the tiles around it as long as they are part of this territory. So as you can see, if I try to start an outpost close to the border, I will only get plus 7 food plus 2 production because we will not be exploiting these tiles. These are part of the other territory. And while you can attach it later and get the benefit of the tiles, you will not exploit them early on if you start your outpost at the border. So that's something to keep in mind. It's something pretty important to keep in mind. Let's explore a bit more here. So here's a decent spot. Plus 16 food and plus 5 production. That is not bad. Generally speaking, I would aim for like at least 6 or 7 production, or industry rather, because if you get 2 or 3, that's just not enough. Your outpost will take a while to grow, because the outpost does not turn into a city instantly. It needs a little bit of time to actually grow, and you'll need industry for that. So we'll probably grab this territory over here. It's a pretty decent one. Plus 24 is good. Plus 7 production is good enough. So that's what we're going for. There it is. Now we can claim more immediately after if we have influence. This is one of the most important uses of influence early in the game. Use influence to claim territory, basically. That's what you use it for. As you can see here, Starting an outpost right here will cost us 20 influence. And while we're not getting any just yet, because there's nothing to get it from, we did get 30 from Curiosities. Which means I can start another outpost basically right away. We could also start it here if we want to. So if I wanted to claim this unknown strategic resource right now, I could grab this right now. Ultimately, we want to grab as much as we can, obviously. And here's another unknown strategic resource. And here's our first neighbor. Now we made contact with our first neighbor, the Egyptians. So we will talk about diplomacy and relations a little bit later. There's not much we can actually do with him right now. We can offer a treaty to trade luxuries, but we won't actually be trading anything yet because they probably don't have any yet. We can share maps if we want to, we can have open borders, and we can have non-aggression pact. So right now it doesn't really matter too much. We don't necessarily want to share our map with him. And open borders at this super early stage of the game do not matter too much. We can offer luxury trades just to try to keep decent relations with him. And if you hover over here, it shows his attitude and what goes into it. It will be divided into trust and strength categories. And you can see that we got a positive boost with him because he proposed the treaty and he accepted. And we are also less powerful than them. So he's stronger. It will tell you here. It can be useful, but it can also be misleading because just because one 
civilization is stronger than the others does not mean that can't change pretty quickly. Alright, but let's focus on early game things. We are going to start a city right here, because that's a decent location, with decent yields, and now we can see that we will need six turns to turn this into an outpost, because we need a total of 35 production, and we are getting six per turn. This one needs four more turns, and while we wait for that, we can ransack the sanctuary right here, to get 10 gold. The Mammoth is peaceful, so it will not attack our outpost, no need to worry about that. If we leave it alone, it will not attack us. And we should definitely leave it alone, with a single scout in the area. Let's go explore some more then. Maybe we can find something interesting, like a natural wonder. And then we can talk about that. Now, we don't want to connect our territory, so we will explore the land in between. Here's a curiosity, and we got 40 gold from that. Now we have 90 gold, despite not having any income. Now, terrain is very important in the game, as you might have guessed already, because it will limit how you can move a lot. For example, here we have a cliff. And not only I can't move down this cliff, if we were in combat here, with our battlefield covering this area, I could have a ranged unit on top of this cliff and shoot anything down there, potentially. Not to mention all the high ground bonuses and things like that. Terrain is extremely important in this game. And then we have choke points like here and the river. Attacking while crossing a river gives you a penalty. So, terrain is super important for combat in this game, extremely important. Just something to keep in mind. Okay, here's another curiosity. Now we are basically waiting uh, to get an outpost, and once we get an outpost, then we will be able to turn it into a city. And here we can see somebody else claimed some land not too far away from us, because this border has a different color, and now not white. Let's hope relations yep. Go well. hey, so here's another one. We can introduce ourselves, from my people. and, and we can well. propose a treaty just to try to stay friendly with them. We can see he's hesitant right now. This? So hopefully that will make him less hesitant. We can see where his city is. Right here, not too far away from us. Let's go explore some more. We got 20 gold. And now we can pick our research. So, there's the whole tech tree right here. And there's a lot to talk about here. I won't be talking about every single tech in here. But there are some pretty important ones early on. For example, Calendar will allow you to actually improve these luxuries over here. They give you all sorts of benefits, but you can't get the benefits if you don't research Calendar. So, we can start with Calendar. We aren't actually getting any science right now, so uh, this would take an extremely long time. We are getting one, because we got some population and we got our legacy trade up here. By building an outpost, claiming territory... So, there's our first outpost. Of course, is we could wait two more turns and have our capital yeah, over here instead, but there's no real need to do that. And so, you get your city by clicking right here. This is the option to evolve outpost to a city. And normally this costs influence. This can actually cost quite a lot of influence, depending on how many cities you have. But your first city in the game does not cost influence, so it's free. Once I click this, this will become a proper city. There we go. Now, here is our emblematic quarter, as they call it. This is your unique district that you have because you are this particular culture. And you only have access to it while you are that culture. So, as you might remember, I mentioned that this counts as both farmer's quarter and the research quarter. 
if I turn on the yields again, so right now we are only working the tiles that are around our city center. That's the main plaza. That's our actual like city center kind of thing. And we are working everything that's around it automatically. You don't have to assign anyone to actually work these tiles like you do in civilization, for example. What you do instead is assign your population up here. And depending on where you assign them, you will generate more of that resource. For example, if I hover over food here, I will see that we get plus 15 from exploitation, which is all these tiles around here. We get plus 6 food from the main plaza. We can actually see it right here, 6 food on the main plaza. And we get plus 2 food from the narrative event that we had earlier. So this all adds up to 14. If I also work it with my pop, I will get additional plus 6 because he's a farmer and he will generate 6 as a farmer, which is this number right here. This number right here tells you how much your one pop will generate if you assign him here. So he will uh, uh, generate 6 of that resource. I can assign him to anything, any one of these resources, and he will generate 6 extra. Then we have this bar over here which tells you how quickly your city is going to grow. If I leave this guy assigned to anything other than food, we will need three turns to generate another population, and then we will have two dudes to assign to things. If I assign him to food, we will only need two turns to generate another pop. So that's your decision. We can work industry to build things faster, or we can wait to get another pop faster and then reassign them. There's a lot that goes into it, and you don't have to micromanage this every single turn, but on highest difficulties, especially early in the game, managing this can be pretty important. Because getting that extra 6 is kind of a big deal when your total is only 8 or 20. So, yeah. Anyway, let's talk about actually building things. There are three major categories of things you can work on in your city. There are districts, infrastructures, well, four, units and public ceremonies. So public ceremonies are basically things you can do as many times as you like, and you will get certain benefit for doing it. So we could work on a feast to get more food, we're not going to do that. We could get another scout, which would cost us 45 industry, but also one population. As you can see on this tooltip right here, and right here, getting this scout would cost us population. And then my city would lose this guy, and not have him anymore. That's the thing about humankind. Every unit in the game is worth at least one population. So by the same token, what I can do is disband this scout and it will give me plus one population. It even says so on the tooltip. Disbanding a unit within the limits of one of your cities or outposts will grant you one population in that city or outpost. I'm not actually going to disband him right now, but this is something very important to remember. If you lose a scout, let's say to a mammoth or anything else, you actually effectively lose one population. This is very important, especially early on. So, uh, back to building things. If we want to actually exploit more tiles around here, we have to build districts. And normally districts have to be adjacent to at least one of your other districts. This is how a city grows. There are exceptions to that rule, but we won't be talking about those right now. We have three different districts that we can build. The Maker's Quarter and the Farmer's Quarter. These are things you always have. You have access to them right from the start of the game. They do not require any technologies. You will always have them. So Maker's Quarter gives you industry, as you might have guessed. So we will get plus one industry from this. We will get plus one industry per adjacent Maker's Quarter and we will get plus one worker slot on city or outpost. Because right now, 
I cannot assign more than two workers to industry, or food, or gold, or science. This is the max. So if I had free population here, I would not be able to assign more than two of them to industry. You increase that number by building maker's quarters, among other things. And we will also lose 10 stability. So that's the last bar over here, which is also very important. Stability is fairly self-explanatory. If your stability drops too low, uh, your city will be in trouble. You, it can also actually revolt and spawn some hostile units. You can get all kinds of penalties. So this is an important number to keep an eye on. And stability is basically what soft caps your growth and your city's expansion. Because you can make your cities really, really big by attaching more territories to that particular city. You can also build a lot of districts, you can get a lot of population, but the more your city grows, the more stability penalties it will take. And you will have to counter those stability penalties. So there's no hard cap on how big and how expansive a city can get. There is rather a soft cap in the form of stability. But there's no actual hard cap. There is kind of a hard cap in terms of how many workers you can have. But especially later on, it's pretty easy to increase that. And you can still have more population than worker slots available. That is possible. And then use that population to recruit an army. Since every unit costs you at least one pop. There's quite a lot that goes into it, but basically what you need to know is that stability is basically what soft caps your city's growth and expansion. So, anyway, if we want to exploit more tiles around here, we have to build more districts. So if I build a farmer's quarter here, you can see this is the location that's suggested by the game. We don't have to build it there, but you will see uh, here, kind of an overlay on the tiles to the west. They will go from 0 to 3, 0 to 2, and 0 to 4. And that's simply because that is the yield they have right now. But we are not exploiting them because they are not adjacent to any of our districts. And the farmer's quarter exploits food. I mean, it's a farmer's quarter, so that makes sense. The maker's quarter exploits industry. So if I place the maker's quarter here, you can see that it will actually lose free food because I will no longer be exploiting the tile with free food on it because it will now have the maker's quarter but it will not get any of this food from the tiles next to it because it's a maker's quarter. It gives you industry and not food. So all I would get is this plus one industry it gets by default. That's the first row on the tooltip here. Plus one industry, that's all it would get. If I build it on the east side, however, I will still lose free food because I will build it on a tile with food that I'm otherwise exploiting with my main plaza. But we would gain a plus eight industry because the tile with the actual maker's quarter will give us one. Then we will get three on the mountain, two on this forested river, and two on this tile right here. So that adds up to a total of 8. 3 plus 2, plus 2, plus 1. That's a total of 8. So that's kind of how it works. There's quite a bit that goes into how you can plan your city's expansion. And min-maxing that aspect of the game can be quite challenging sometimes as well. But if you don't want to bother with that, you can just go with the location that's suggested by the game. A lot of the time, it's a pretty good suggestion, not always, however. So you shouldn't necessarily always just blindly click on whatever is suggested by the game. Or at least think for just a moment if this is actually a good idea. Usually it's fine, but not always. In this case, we will build a farmer's quarter because we need food to get more population, and with more population we get more of everything, we'll be able to get units, we'll be able to get all kinds of things. 
So we'll build a farmer's quarter here. And then there's actually the astronomy house. So I will show you the difference here. If I build the astronomy house, for example here, I will get nine food as well, because the astronomy house also counts as a farmer's quarter. But it also counts as a research quarter. Now, right now, this doesn't really matter that much, because research is something you don't get very often from actual terrain. You mostly get food and industry. However, it will matter later on when you will be able to build research quarters themselves and they get more bonuses from other adjacent research quarters. So this is totally also a viable option to build right now. However, it will take a little bit longer to get, so we can start from a farmer's quarter. And as you can see, it will also get plus free science from adjacent farmer's quarters. So what we can do is build a few farmer's quarters in this general area, because this general area mostly has food and not much else and then build the astronomy house kind of in the middle, with a bunch of farmers' quarters adjacent to it. And it will give us a decent amount of extra science. But first we'll build the farmers' quarter, so if I move my guy around, you will see. I have two options here, basically. I can ascend him to food, and my city will grow into turns, which will give me a second citizen to assign to something. But then my farmers' quarter will take 9 turns to build, because it requires 70 industry and I'm only getting 8 per turn. Or I could assign my pop to industry, which would give me 14, and we will complete farmer's quarters in 5 turns. Our city will grow slower, but it will still grow in 3 turns. So 3 turns from now, we will still get another citizen. So in this case, that's probably a better option for us because we will only grow one turn slower, but we will build the farmer's quarter much faster, and the farmer's quarter will give us more food without having to use actual population on it. So that's what we'll do here. I could also disband my scout right now and get another pop immediately, and then assign that pop to things immediately. You have to, like, weigh all these things yourself. Do you want to keep your extra scouts? to cover more ground, to explore more, to get more outposts, to get more curiosities? Or do you want to disband them more, to get more pop, to get that boost early on? It's actually not an obvious answer here. There's more than one way to do it. And it depends on all kinds of factors. Maybe you got more tribes from Neolithic era, and you have so many that you can afford to disband a few. Like, it's not really an obvious choice. You won't always do the exact same thing every time. In this case, I only have three scouts, so I'm going to keep them because I need to explore. Or at least I want to explore. So we will explore. By the way, if you follow the same river, you will not have to pay extra movement points, as you might have noticed. So that is something you can do to explore slightly more efficiently. Now, our other outpost will turn into an actual outpost on the next turn. City constructed. Walls, and there it is. Roofs. So normally you can attach ah, outposts from neighboring territories to your city. However, this one does not actually touch our capital. So I cannot attach it because it's not actually adjacent. I will have to claim one more territory in between before I can attach it. So we can actually go and do that. It's probably a good idea. So we will first grab this curiosity, or will we? See, this is the importance of terrain. It's actually not easy to reach it. I will have to go all the way around if I want to do that. I'm still going to do it because it will give us more information in general. And then the other guy can hang out in this area and claim the territory between our capital and our other outpost. And the influence cost to claim territory will scale depending on how far away it is and how many territories under your control it borders. 
So if it borders your other territory, it will be cheaper. As you can see, if I want to claim this one, I would have to pay 70. If I want to claim this one, I will only pay 20. This is actually a very good spot. It's 11 food and 12 production, which is pretty nice balance right there. So I might actually grab that instead of one of these. I should be able to connect my land here, because worst case scenario, if my neighbor claims this land, I will be able to claim this one and still attach my territories. But this will give me more yields and it will also allow me to get this extra land to exploit with my quarters when I attach it to my capital. So that is what we're going to do right here. That's only 20 influence. So we are going to go there and claim that. Now we can go pick up that curiosity and keep exploring. Hopefully find something interesting. Yep, we got two curiosities here. We will pick up both of them. Here's Kalendar. And uh, now I actually got attacked by one of my neighbors here. I will not fight him because I would most certainly lose. We will actually retreat. And now because he attacked me, we will have a grievance. So the way this works is that when other civilization takes some kind of action against you or if something happens, you will sometimes be able to make a demand because of it. So in this case, because he attacked me, I can demand that he pay me 100 gold. Or I can renounce uh, that demand. This will have an effect on our relations. If I make a demand, he might accept or he might not accept, but he's probably not going to like us since we're making demands. If we renounce, we might get a bit of a diplomatic boost. So we are going to renounce that and hopefully that will have a positive impact on our relations. Now we can see at the bottom that we renounced our grievances against them. So hopefully that will make him less hesitant. Because we want to stay friendly for now. We do not want to go to war. All right, now we can grab this outpost here. So that's 11 for the 12 production. Now we need three turns for that to turn into an outpost. And then I can show you how we can attach that to your city. So next up, we need to pick our next research. So we could pick domestication. That would allow us to get horses. I can't actually see any at the moment. We could get cut pantry to unlock archers, which is a nice ranged unit, or get a lumber yard. We will talk about infrastructure in just a moment as well. Let's get carpentry, an archer is a nice defensive unit, and lumber yard might be useful. We don't have some forests in the area. Here's yet another AI. So here we have another potential demand, because he's trespassing. So again, I can make a demand for him to pay 100, or I can just be chill and renounce. You can see that he's actually condescending, because we are much less powerful than them, so he probably feels like he could stomp us if he wanted to. You have become a builder and a creator. So we actually finished our farmer's quarter now. So we are getting 16 food at the moment without having to work food with any of our workers. Now we can assign them both to industry and get more industry per turn. Now if I want to build astronomy house, you will see that I will get plus three science if I build it next to my farmer's quarter. So what I could do is build a bunch of farmer's quarter in this general area and then have my astronomy house in the middle to get more science from it. However, there's also infrastructure. Infrastructure is basically everything that you build that you don't build on the actual map. It's part of your city, part of your main plaza. It doesn't actually exist on the strategic map, strictly speaking. So in the case of Pottery Workshop, for example, we would get plus four influence on the main plaza if we build that. And in case of a granary, we would get plus one farmer slot which means we would have four. Right now I'm getting plus one from the farmer's quarter. 
if we get a granary we would have four and we would get additional plus two food per farmer meaning we would get eight per farmer instead of six base value but since influence is a very important resource for expansion we will build the potter workshop which will take three turns it would take four turns if i worked on food instead and if i worked on food our city would still grow in two turns so it would make literally no difference in terms of how quickly our city would grow so this would actually be kind of a waste in a sense we need two more turns for our outpost and then i will show you how we can attach that to make it part of our capital looks like we got attacked yet again so now i can't retreat anymore which probably means i'm going to lose this guy i can still try to defend myself but since he's already wounded it most likely means he's going to die once combat starts you cannot retreat that's not a thing you can do and you cannot retreat more than once per turn so as you can see we actually lost that guy and again now he can make a demand because we technically claimed a territory on his border this territory right here it was right next to my capital but his capital is also right there so it's technically on his border i will still renounce my claim because i want to try to stay friendly with him there's no guarantee i will be able to do that but i want to stay friendly early on we'll pick up that curiosity and we probably want to go back now and potentially disband this guy to get plus one pop and maybe turn him into an archer instead you can't turn him into an archer directly but you can disband him get plus one pop and then use that one pop for a different unit it's a thing you can do so pick up the curiosity here that gives us 20 gold and now we have another outpost so the way you attach the outpost is by clicking a city and then you have an option to actually attach it this will cost us 30 stability or rather 30 influence it will add the population from this outpost to our city right now there's zero so it will not add any and it will add all the extra yields that we are currently exploiting with that outpost so this outpost is currently getting 13 food and 12 industry that will be added to our actual city however when you add a territory to your city you will receive a stability penalty so this is what kind of soft caps how big a city can get this stability can get pretty harsh if you add a lot of territories to your city and the influence cost will also go way up however you can actually have one mega city if you want to there's even an achievement humankind is a great game to play a one city challenge because it's actually very very viable that one city can be a mega city that spans half the continent this is totally a thing you can do not saying it's easy necessarily but you can do it so we will attach this that will cost me 30 and watch my yields up here as i do it here see now we have 32 industry and 25 food and i can assign three people to industry so that made our city quite a bit better and we'll finish pottery workshop on the next turn i can actually move all three of my guys to food for example or one guy to food that will make the city grow in three turns instead of four and assign the other two to science because this pottery workshop will finish on the next turn regardless of what i do with industry there's quite a bit of micro that you can do like this you don't have to but if you like doing it it's definitely worth doing it early on here's a sanctuary we can ransack for some gold and for our next research we will get city defense to hopefully build some actual defenses in case we don't actually end up fighting our neighbor Off we go. now we probably want to claim the territory between uh, our main city and our other outpost to actually be able to attach it a little bit later 
So I will grab this curiosity over here, maybe get the sanctuary, and then most likely move back west. Or I can move this guy east. I have more than one option. I could also disband him if I want to. There are a lot of things you can do, but I think we covered the basics fairly well. So now we finished the pottery workshop. I can move my guys back into industry. And then we could hook up the luxury resources up here. We got silk and another copy of silk. So right now I'm not getting anything out of it because they are not improved. But if I build artisan's quarter on top of them, I will get plus one industry plus three gold from actual exploitation of this style. If I turn on yields, you can see that this style has one industry, three gold. So I will get that one industry and three gold when I build a district on top of it. And we will also get the effect of the actual silk resource, which is plus four stability per silk in all our cities and the plus two industry per silk on each maker's quarter we have. There's also a wondrous effect, which activates when you have a lot of copies of the same resource, which gives you usually a much better bonus. In this case, it would be plus 5% industry per silk and plus 10 stability per silk. These bonuses are usually not easy to get, but they can be quite powerful. So we will improve this because these effects are actually pretty nice. We will improve just one for now, and then we can decide again. So if I move this guy to production, you can see that it will take three turns regardless. So we can keep him on food. We'll get one more pop in two turns, then we can look into what we want to have him on. And actually, I think this will be a decent moment to stop. We covered a lot of ground. Hopefully I didn't miss anything overly important. And if you did enjoy this video, uh, please do leave a like and let me know if you would like to see it continued. And uh, thanks for watching all the way to the end. I really appreciate it. Like I said, leave a like if you enjoyed it. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.